these chords from the Princeton Day School days? Oh, the chords themselves? Well, that's a standard progression, but um, I think Trey came up with all the changes, but I definitely had a whole lot to do with the melody. It wasn't until Trey and I, you know, actually were sitting down uh, years later in 1997 and turned it into Waiting in the Velvet Sea that came out on the story of the ghost and became sort of a big fish song. All right, Mark, are you ready to light the fuse? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Interpretation. Reflection. Misdirection. That's my job. It really is my job. I write words for fish. I'm Tom Marshall, and this is Under the Scales. I'm here with my friend Mark Dowd. And we are starting the podcast. We, the podcast is already going on. So maybe we should tell them why we're doing the podcast. <laughs> uh, good point. All right. Well, I've been going to fish shows for 31 years, and I've met a lot of amazing people along the way. And these people have made fish a major part of their life. And talking to them individually, you can hear stories that together create this rich, undocumented history that I plan to bring to light. All right. I'll do that by interviewing Lots of people. Of course, I'm going to interview Fish, the band, and people that work for the band, and people who have traveled to see the band, and people who write songs for the band, right? And of course, I'm going to explore the incredibly diverse fan base. Many of these fans are devoted to the music or the message in some way, and some have formed organizations or businesses. And these are the people I'm going to talk to, people who have contributed to the scene and people who have gotten inspired from the scene. And then there's people who work to tour with fish, people who cook burritos and grilled cheeses on the, the shakedown. lot. Yeah, the shakedown um, vendors, they're incredibly, uh, a lot of them have amazing stories. And then uh, songs by fish, what do they mean? I get that question a lot. So we can explore that. And then there's festivals and shows that need a deeper dive. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. These are the behind the scenes stories that I'm calling under the scales. I mean, let's go back to the beginning, where it all began. Well, it all began, at least it began for me in Princeton in 1963. I was born in Princeton, and I still live pretty close to there, Princeton, New Jersey. I spent a chunk of my childhood in Sweden, though. My mom's Swedish. Uh, it was my first language. But when we came back to America, uh, my dad was a professor at Rutgers University in electrical engineering. My mom was a real estate agent. And then I went to... Uh, PDS, and that's where I met Trey in the eighth grade. Princeton Day School. Yes, Princeton Day School. Should we go there? Yeah, I was planning to take you there. You want to go see it? Yeah, so that's where you guys started a band together. Right, yeah, we started uh, a band called Bivouac, um, and we started playing and writing original songs together then. So this is Princeton Day School, and I was, I was just going to say, so I redid eighth grade, and, and being uh, my ego, everything changed. Okay. I became like from sort of semi-bullied smaller guy, young for my grade, to a bigger, more confident, right. tall guy, old for my grade. So uh, when I got to Princeton Day School, it was a class of 100, and there was something like five or six bands, and none of them had a keyboard player. So basically I had two keyboards, and I just started going to, like, I was kind of in a few bands. <laughs> Before long, though, playing Jumping Jack Flash at a party. And I was thinking, like, I don't really even like this song. No one at the party was even listening. And right. it was just like a stupid band and stupid just background yeah. noise. And so that's when I just said, you know what? Uh, I don't think I'm going to be in bands anymore. And uh, this is all different. Completely changed. Um, 
yeah, the, this road used to go through. So uh, that's when I started writing with this guy Mark Daubert and Dave Abrahams. He grabbed an acoustic guitar and Dave Abrahams was pretty good at electric guitar. He could play like Steve Howe, um, you know, from Yes. He could play the clap. And that was like unheard of. We formed a band called And Back very, very rapidly. This was right around the time when um, Trey was still a drummer, but the, the grade had five drummers. And I don't know if that was behind Trey's motivation. He would claim no to switch to guitar. What he said to me a few times when I asked him why he switched, you're a drummer or why are you playing guitar? He would just, uh, he would just say, well, I'm actually always been a guitarist. I'm not really a drummer. And no one can argue with that. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he really loved and back. He loved it, and he was like very, very excited by the prospect that we were writing our own stuff. And so he rapidly became sort of like the destination for songs that that I would write, you know, because he reacted so well. Other people were like, "Yo, what the fuck is this shit?" You know, it's like badly recorded. He heard the potential and he was yeah. like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. And then before long, I was recording with Trey. We would listen to um, Yes, Close to the Edge, which to me was like a towering masterpiece. And Trey would say things to me at the time, outrageous shit, like, we can do better than this. And I would look at him like, what? Sacrilege. And, and fuck if he didn't do it, you know? Right. <laughs> He beat close to the edge with you enjoy myself, as far as I'm concerned. It seems like Trey was one of those guys that always knew he would be a successful musician. Oh, no doubt. He was kind of always looking ahead to this future that uh, no one necessarily, of us anyway, uh, could see. But, um, I mean, I have, an ex I have two examples. I, I actually have three examples of that. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you them now. I just thought of them. So the first one is my mom. Uh, she knew that I was friends with lots of musicians. And these are people that play music. You know, my friend Pete, uh, he's a great, great, great drummer. He practiced like six, seven hours a day. But one time she came to me and she said, hey, Tom, of all, she called me Tommy. Tommy, of all these friends of yours, uh, is any one of them going to make it musically? And without hesitating, I, I said, Trey has the best chance. And she, she goes, well, you should stick with him then. <laughs> and this was in 10th grade. So that was pretty, that had some foresight. So that was, uh, that was 1980. So my mom could see fish coming around the bend, I guess, maybe. Um, uh, and then uh, the second uh, one that I was really thinking of was, was hilarious was, um, so Trey, for a while, uh, after the first year of college, b both ended sort of miserably for both him and me for different reasons. Um, I would go to his dad's house where we were recording music all the time. We had a studio set up in his, his dad's basement. tell you more about this in a future podcast we're going to go in depth in this but um the cool thing about trey is that when you park outside his house you could hear music from inside but sometimes it would be silent and it'd be mysterious and sometimes the doors would be locked or sometimes they'd be open and you'd never know where you'd find trey because he would be hiding a mic in the basement 
and then he'd put his amplifier upstairs just to hear how it sounds or he'd be hiding a mic in the bathroom and like recording an acoustic guitar in there uh, just for that weird sound. And so I, was ne- I wasn't surprised that he didn't answer the door and I opened the door and it was silent and I was calling Trey, Trey, Trey. And I kind of walked around the corner into the kitchen and all of a sudden he screamed at me. He's like, get the fuck out of here. Like he really scared the shit out of me. I didn't even know he was there. And he screamed, he goes, really get the fuck out. Like, I'm like, okay, what? like what's going on? And his hand was down the um, disposal. And I guess he was like pulling out like this mangled spoon that he had dropped in there. And it was like got mangled in the blades. And I guess he thought that I would like come in and, and accidentally brush the disposal power on and, and take off his hand. And, and he was still yelling at me. And he, and he said, he said this quote, he goes, my hands are my life. <laughs> And I was like, what? And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, looking back at it later, he's right. You know, it wouldn't wouldn't have been a good time right around 1983, uh, I guess this was, wow. uh, for him to get his hand chopped off. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and then the last one is, uh, in, in a similar way, um, one day I w- went to his house and the door wasn't answered immediately. <laughs> uh, and so, again, I, I walked in. And uh, this time I was with my friend Mark and we walked down the stairs and we heard him playing guitar, you know, some good Southern rock kind of jamming, just really kind of spilling from his room. And so we opened the door and he w- didn't hear us come in and he was bouncing in front of a mirror, playing guitar and bouncing. And it's so funny because that's exactly now what he does, like in You Enjoy Myself and Mike's song. Uh, it was exactly almost as if he could see himself in the future on stage with fish bouncing. And then back then he had this long hair. And so as he bounced, his hair kind of went weightless and he was just watching himself in the mirror going up and down, up and down (laughs) and playing guitar at the same time. So yes, I do think he had some sort of vision of himself on stage playing music as his career. So how much longer after that did fish form? Oh, uh, well, keep in mind that that was that happened basically in what would have been our freshman year. So then Trey and I had ahead of us still basically four years of college. So I went back to Rutgers University and he went back to Goddard University in Vermont. The whole time we were in school, I would send him lyrics, but we rarely saw each other. And I don't think we wrote together. And then when uh, we graduated, I was a computer science major. Um, He kind of took off and you know, got fish going. And that was when fish was just in its heyday, just growing by leaps and bounds. And I was sending him lyrics whenever I could. And then eventually we started going on songwriting trips. And that was fantastic. Our relationship continued from a distance for a while, but now we really enjoy writing together. And we've been doing it 30 years. We write an average of about 10 songs a year. That's over 300 songs. Nice. And that takes us to today. So we've talked about you and, and your relationship to fish. Uh, now maybe we should discuss like how this podcast was started. Uh, sure. Yeah, we kind of, you're right. We talked about why I'm doing the podcast and how my relationship kind of with Trey blossomed into a relationship with fish, which uh, I'm forever grateful for. Um But yeah, how the podcast actually happened, I guess, was really, you know, I'm working for startup companies these days, and uh, that's how I met you in Atlanta, and you got me turned turned on to podcasting, and uh, one of them, of course, that you got me interested in first was called... Analyze Fish. Analyze Fish, and uh, I want to, of course, listen to anything about fish, and this really Mm -hmm. got me excited. It was hilarious. It was about a guy, Harris Whittles, who was trying to convince... Scott Ackerman. Yeah, a yeah. friend of his who didn't like fish. The I've, reasons to listen to fish, and it was hilarious. Yeah, I've always loved Scott Ackerman and uh, Comedy Bang Bang, and uh, I thought, you know, this uh, if, if Tom can get into podcasts, maybe this will be his intro to podcasts. It sure did, and when I uh, found out about it, it turned out that a lot of people in the community, of course, were already listening because Harris Whittles is also famous he, as the... Uh, one of the head writers of um, Parks and Rec, Parks and Recreation, yeah. which was that huge show. Tragically, Harris Whittles died after only, I don't know, I think fewer than 10 Analyzed Fish podcasts. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were a juggernaut. They were on their way. 
uh, and each one funnier than the last. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, I really loved hearing them sort of expound about, you know, uh, Scott would really trash me as far as lyrics would go and stuff. And so it was sort of painful and yet <laughs> wonderful. Uh, but really got me into podcasting. And uh, so anyway, thank you, uh, Mark, for that. Yeah. That was cool. So we should probably tell what's next for the podcast. Uh, sure. Yeah. I have begun recording and talking to some really interesting people, people that you might recognize the names of, a few of them for sure. And uh, also just people uh, from the audience, like I said, who have a story to tell. And uh, that's kind of the, the beautiful thing about this podcast is that I think you're going to learn a lot about your fellow fish fans, but also you might learn some stuff about the people uh, playing the music or bringing you the music or helping the music proliferate in some way. And that's what it's really all about. Well, Mark, thanks a lot for being in the studio today with me. And uh, yeah, it was fun taking a drive around my old school. Thanks and, for the ride. Uh, I got to show you some of Princeton and some places where Trey and I wrote songs together. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Along with uh, Mark Daubert and Dave Abrahams, of course. Um, and uh, so anyway, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. See you soon. Thanks for listening to Under the Scales, the podcast about fish fans, their culture, and secrets, if we're lucky. Quick thank you to my producer, Mark Dowd, and my sister podcast, HF Pod. Some of the music you hear in my show is, of course, fish, but also it's often my old band Amphibian with an F. Using songs Anthony cries on and I wrote for our album, Skip the Goodbyes. Find him at njrecordingstudio.com. I'll interview you if you want as well. Go to underthescales.com and click the Tell Your Story button. If you're at all serious, your submission will definitely get to me. For other matters, write to me at tom at underthescales.com and follow our Twitter here at underthescales. See you next week. Under the Scales.